you will turn your Bibles tonight to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, look at verses 12 through 34 tonight, continuing our study in the letter of uh, Paul to the first, or letter of Paul to the Corinthians, we refer to it as 1 Corinthians. The title message tonight is The Resurrection, the Lynchpin of Christianity. The Resurrection, the Lynchpin of Christianity. Again, we'll be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 34. And if you would please stand in honor of God's Word as we read this together. So as we um, are continuing here tonight, this is the fifth and final controversy that Paul is addressing at the church at Corinth, and it is the false teaching denying that there is a resurrection. Now last week we considered the question of how do we know that Jesus Christ resurrected? We looked at verses 1 through 11 where Paul recounts the early witnesses and the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. But this week we will look at the implications of Jesus' resurrection and basically deal with the question of so what if Jesus didn't resurrect? So what if he just rose figuratively? And so what if he did resurrect? And so that's what we're going to look at tonight here in verses 12 through 19 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So Paul is looking at these implications. He says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith also vain, is also vain. Yea, or yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, you, and you are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Let's go in prayer together. Father, we thank you, God, for your word. We thank you, God, for the revelation, the, um, the light that it gives us, God. We thank you, Lord, for the historically reliable accounts of the resurrection, of all the events surrounding it, the events surrounding the life of Jesus, his miracles, um, everything that he began to, to teach and to do, every claim that he made. And, and God, we thank you, Lord, that you have preserved these things, that you have preserved this record, that God, we can go back and read over these things, and that we can uh, consider these things and believe them, and to know uh, with what certainty that they have been taught and preached, and the facts upon which they're established. So God, I pray that would be made so clear tonight, God, that we would understand, God, how true the resurrection is and how essential it is. And God, I pray that that would be made clear for us tonight, God, as we are basing our entire life, our entire eternity upon the, the truth of Christianity, the truth of your Son, and the claims of your Son, Jesus Christ. I pray that we would understand tonight, God, just how essential this is, how it changes, literally changes everything. It changes everything. I hope we can see that tonight through our time together, and that, God, we would understand these implications, and not only understand them intellectually, but that, God, we can, we can understand these things and apply them to our life and to see these implications lived out in our lives. So, God, we pray your blessing upon our time together tonight. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Be seated. So, as we consider what Paul's addressing here, what we find is that Jesus, and I think C.S. Lewis covers this well, but Jesus puts the, the entire world on the spot. Every person who encounters the claims of Christianity has a decision to make. Now they may try to dismiss that decision, they may, they may try to avoid it, but every person that encounters the claims of Christianity has a decision to make. To either believe and accept that Jesus of Nazareth rose from the dead, or to disbelieve and reject that claim. That's what this comes down to. Now, you, and it's important that we say this because what we run into today in our, in our culture, you have something that's called religious pluralism, which is basically saying, oh, there's many different ways. You see um, kind of a symbol of this would be, you've, you've seen bumper stickers that spell out the word coexist in different religious symbols. That's, that's a kind of an, a vivid, or a, an image of this idea of religious pluralism to say, well, just be sincere in your Christianity the way this individual is sincere in their, their Muslim beliefs. This person is sincere in their atheism and trying to be a good person. And, and so there, there's this kind of 
of muddying of the water within our culture in particular. And that's why I want to state this so emphatically to say, okay, you have, a dis you have a choice to make, a decision to make. Either Jesus Christ, either you accept and believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead or he did not. It's yes or no. You can't say, well, he sort of did, he did it in a sense. It is either yes or no. That is the claim of Christianity. To say otherwise is, is to change the claim that Christianity makes. Today, May 29, 2022, according to Christianity today, May 29, 2022, Jesus is either dead or alive. Do you believe that he is alive today? If, I mean, that's what Christianity teaches. He is, he rose from the dead. He ascended back to the Father. He never died again. That body, the same body that hung upon the cross, that, that walked on the Sea of, of Galilee, that same body is in the presence of God the Father, seated at the right hand of the Father. He resurrected bodily and ascended back to the Father, and he is still alive today. Jesus is either dead or alive. That is what Christianity confronts this world with. That Christ has come, the Savior of the world has come. He died upon a cross. He rose again on the third day. It is claiming Jesus is alive. He has risen from the dead. He is alive today. That is the claim of Christianity. The only other option is he's dead. There is no other option. He cannot be both. Because, I mean, in America, let me tell you one of the favorite phrases in America, something like, you know, either it's this or it's that, and we like to say, yes. And so, oh, it's so clever. We like to say, oh, you, it, that's just a perceived, you know, uh, what you call a dichotomy, an either or. It's not really an either or. It can be both. We, we, we're always, you know, we think about uh, as Americans that we're uncompromising. We are very compromising. We're always looking for the compromise. As soon as you present somebody with an either or in our mind, we automatically think of, well, what's the, what's the middle? What would be the moderate position between this extreme or that extreme? But when it comes to Christianity, this is, I mean, there are the, the writers of the New Testament, um, God himself and his revelation has gone to great lengths to say that is not an option. Jesus cannot be sort of dead and alive. He is either dead, he died on the cross and stayed dead, or he rose again. He is either dead or alive. He cannot be both. Let me put it this way. If, if the apostles hallucinated, if they were just, they were so under such distress because of all that they had gone through, all that they had witnessed, if they hallucinated, or if, they, if the claim is true that they stole the body and then they lied about it and said he resurrected, or if we say that Jesus rose figuratively or metaphorically, if we say that his spirit lives on in our hearts today, that the spirit of Christ is in us, he's dead. All of that, all of that is just fancy wording for saying he's dead. We, we, we've decided, dead or alive, dead. Now you can try to, you can try to dress that up with different language and, and try to uh, frame that in different ways, but the fact is what you're saying is Jesus is dead. And what Paul is saying is, and if Jesus is dead, guess what? Christianity is dead. If Jesus is dead, Christianity is dead with him. It is dead. It is absolutely false. We are in the wrong place tonight if Christ is dead. It is dead. It is false. None of this is true. Jesus is not the Son of God. The cross did nothing. There is no payment for sin. The apostles, the, one of the apostolic writings that we're reading tonight that we say is the inspired word of God, it isn't. The apostles are false witnesses. And they are false witnesses of a false teacher. Now you may say, well, but, okay, I don't think Jesus supernaturally resurrected from the dead. I don't think that's, I don't think that's possible. But I do think that Jesus, you know, I read Matthew 5, and I think Jesus had some tremendous moral teaching. He did not. Those are the writings of a false teacher. Jesus, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, he, is, he immediately becomes a false teacher. Everything he claimed is either substantiated or it is made no longer credible 
It is substantiated if he resurrected, or it is no longer credible if he did not, because now he's a false teacher who made false claims. He claimed over and over again, I will rise again. After I, after I am crucified, turn over the hands of the, of the religious leaders. They're going to mock me. They're going, they're going to try me. They're going to crucify me. But then on the third day, I will rise again. If he, if he made that claim, and that claim is false, he is a false teacher. The apostles are false witnesses of a false teacher. And here's where these implications become so real, and so are we. Our whole vacation Bible school is based upon a false premise. If we are telling children, Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, if He did not resurrect, He is not. He is not the Savior of the world. The apostles are false witnesses of a false teacher, and so are we. We are liars. I am a liar. I may be sincere in trying to, to live out or to believe or to keep this thing alive, but the fact is, if Christ is dead, I am a liar. And I want you to understand, again, the, the stakes of this. As we're sitting here this evening, that's exactly what Muslims claim. They claim that Christianity is a false religion. They claim that I am a false teacher, that you are a false teacher or a false believer that you are believing false teachings. That's exactly what, there's a, there's a billion people in this world who would say this is all a false claim. Christ, not only did he not resurrect, he never even died on the cross, according to Islam. That's either true or it's false. That's exactly what a Muslim would say. That's also exactly what an atheist would say and exactly what an atheist thinks of us. And what I'm saying tonight is they are correct in their assessment. They are exactly right if there is no resurrection. That's what Paul is saying. The false teachers at Corinth were denying. They weren't just, they, actually they weren't even specifically denying the resurrection of Jesus. They were denying the whole idea of a resurrection. The idea that, that when we die, that's not the end. That there's going to be a resurrection on the last day. There will be a resurrection. There is existence beyond the grave. There is a, a bodily resurrection that every person will be resurrected to stand before God on the last day in the judgment. They are denying that there is a resurrection. They were denying the idea of a resurrection, that it was impossible. As we talked about last week, the, the Greek idea, the Corinthians come from a Greek background. The Greek idea was that the physical was evil, the spiritual was good, and that whenever you died, your spirit was liberated. It, it was sprung, free from this, this bondage of being in the flesh, of being in this limited, corruptible, physical body. And so in their mind, they're thinking it's undesirable. Why would you ever want your body to resurrect? Why would you want the physical to return? You've been liberated from that. So in their mind, they would see this as undesirable and probably also see this as impossible. They, 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 some of the most intelligent men to ever live were, were, had already lived there in, in, in Greece and part of the, the Greek Empire. These were intelligent men, and they would deny that and say this is impossible. This is, and, they, and there was even times at... Um, if you remember at Mars Hill, Acts chapter 17, when Paul is speaking there and he's talking about the unknown God, he goes through these descriptions and then he mentions the resurrection. What happens next? They laugh him, they laugh him out of the arena because he mentioned the resurrection. They saw that as absurd. The Corinthians come from that same background. That they would see the resurrection, this idea of a resurrection, a bodily resurrection as impossible and or undesirable. But what Paul is saying is the idea or concept of the resurrection in general is inseparably tied to Jesus' resurrection. You get both or you get neither. You cannot say there is not a resurrection without saying that Jesus did not resurrect. And you cannot say that Jesus resurrected without affirming that there is a resurrection. It's both or it's neither. Another implication we see there in verse 18, it says... Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If there is no resurrection, they're gone. Those who, those who have... Then those also who are fallen asleep in Christ, those who have died in Christ, are perished if there is no resurrection. Christians who have died are either in hell 
or they've gone out of existence. But what Paul is saying is they've perished. They are not in heaven. How could they be? On what basis? We come down to verse 19. It says, if in this life only... And so if there is, if they fall asleep, if they perish, that means this life is all that really that there is, the only hope that we have. That's why Paul says in verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. There is no heaven, there is no eternal life. Jesus claims, and the claims of a false teacher, what he said about heaven was false. What he said about eternal life was false. The idea, John 3, 16, that where Christ said that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There is no everlasting life if Christ did not resurrect. Those are the teachings of a false teacher. That's some of what is riding on this question about the resurrection. Do you know what a linchpin is? It's where we get our title tonight. I've got a picture of this. Um, that's the ocean. Let's see. Um, that's not a linchpin. I'll draw you a picture of what a linchpin looks like. It was just there until the second I referenced it, it evaporated off the screen. Okay. Well... You ever see a wagon wheel? That's what you'll see a picture of probably 30 minutes from now when I no longer need it. But um, have you ever seen a wagon wheel? And on the end of that wagon, on the end of that, um, of that axle, you have all, the, all of this, this mechanism that, that controls the wheel, the center of the wheel. On the very end, there's a linchpin. If you were to walk up and pull that linchpin out, if you were to maybe do that to, to somebody that you really, you, well, here we go. There's an example. That's a linchpin. Now, if, if you were to go and remove that linchpin, you could, I mean, it, it's not just going to, everything's going to fall apart immediately, but if you, were, if you were to play a dirty trick on somebody, let's say in, in, the, in the Old West, and you went over to the, to the far side of a wagon, you were to remove that linchpin, and that person rides off, What's going to happen next? The wheels come off. I mean, they're going to get up to a pretty good speed. It may take a little bit of a while for it to work its way off, but that wheel is going to come off. It doesn't matter how good the wheel, how good of the condition the wheel's in, the wagon's in, anything else. If you remove just that small linchpin, all the wheels come off. That's where we get the saying when we refer to something as a linchpin. What I'm saying tonight is the resurrection of Jesus. What, we're, what Paul is saying and emphasizing the Corinthians is this. The resurrection of Jesus is the linchpin of Christianity. Without it, the wheels come completely off. And on that, on that wagon, on that cart, is heaven, is eternal life, is that Jesus was the Son of God. All these other doctrines are there. And when you remove that, the wheels come off all of it. it is, the resurrection of Jesus is the linchpin of Christianity. And the false teachers at Corinth had decided that the linchpin was unnecessary, it was impossible, and it was undesirable. Now, as you consider, you know, keep thinking about this analogy. A wagon owner can make a decision and decide that that linchpin is not necessary and can remove it. They can make that decision. They can, in their mind, they can claim and they can say, this, this certain piece is unnecessary and they can remove it. But there is a big difference between his decision and the fact itself. Because that decision would be the wrong decision with catastrophic consequences. In the same way, false beliefs and false teaching about the resurrection a billion Muslims saying there was no cross, therefore there certainly wasn't any resurrection, cannot, that false teaching cannot put Jesus back in the tomb. It cannot change the fact. But it can be a wrong decision with catastrophic consequences. Because Christ is risen and Christ is alive. The claims are true. Look at verses 20 through 24. 
So Paul, after he's listing some of these implications, of so, so what if Christ did not resurrect? Well, he gave the implications. We're false teachers. We're false witnesses of God. There is no resurrection. There is no, we're still in our sins. But he comes down in verse 20, but he says this, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept, those who have died. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits. After, afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power. To the claim, there isn't, if someone were to claim and say there isn't going to be a resurrection, there is, there's no such thing as a resurrection, there's not going to be a resurrection, you die, the end, that's it. My counter to that would be this, it's already happened. Not, no, I, no, I know it will happen, I know that there's going to be a resurrection, God has said there will be a resurrection, I wouldn't say that, I would say it has already happened. What we're, what we're disputing is not this revelation, this prophecy that this is going to occur. What we are debating, if you say there isn't going to be a resurrection, is a historical fact. It's already happened. It's already started. We're not just talking about something in the future. We're talking about something that has already occurred. Because the resurrection of Jesus is inseparably tied to our resurrection, to the resurrection, at the last day, at Christ's coming, as it's described here in verse 23. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming, then cometh the end. On that last day. It's so what we're seeing here is that as we are connected and unified to Christ in his humanity, and in our faith in Christ, we are united in His resurrection. I'll put it this way. He rose for us. Just as He took on flesh for us. As this is talking about all of this ties in. The incarnation. We celebrate Christmas that Christ took, that the Son of God, the divine Son of God took on, in His divine nature, took on a human nature. He did that for us. He took on humanity. For us, He took on flesh for us, and He died on the cross for us. It was purely for our benefit and for the glory of the Father. He took on flesh for us, He died for us, and He rose for us. Because our resurrection is inseparably tied, with his resur tied to His resurrection. Basically, I put it this way, He took on humanity to come and rescue us. In our humanity, in our fallen state, He took on humanity to rescue us. United with us in His humanity and death, so that we might be united with Him in His resurrection. That is what Paul is describing here in verses 20 through 24. We come last to verses 25 through 28. I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. This is a, a long chapter, so I'm trying to get through as many verses as we can tonight, while still, while still covering them and doing them justice. But in verse 25, it goes on, continuing the same thought. He says, For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he has accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. What Paul is saying is that he is saying that Christ, who had the ultimate humiliation in his trial, in his, in, in his mockery, in his torture, and in his execution, that this same Christ who had the ultimate uh, humiliation, Christ will have the ultimate victory over all, including death. And that's where the resurrection comes in. When you say there's no resurrection, you're saying, well, Christ cannot have, have the ultimate victory over death. Oh, yes, he can. And that's what the resurrection, that's what the resurrection is evidence of. Christ will have the ultimate victory over all, including death. Death being the consequence of rebellion. He will be Lord of all. And what, what he's saying there, it's kind of confusing wording there in those last few verses. But, but it's saying that he will be Lord of all. Of course, this is excluding God the Father. 
Because it is God the Father, as Philippians 2, 9 through 10 says, it is God the Father who has highly exalted Christ, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, all of that to the glory of the Father. So when it says that everything will be under His feet, that's of course excluding the Father Himself. But everything else will be under the feet of Jesus. We come on down to verse, the last verse we'll look at, verse 29 through 34. Verse 29, so Paul picks up again with more implications, the final implications about if there isn't a resurrection. He says, else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? if the dead rise not at all. Why are they then baptized for the dead? Do you know what verse 29 is saying? Do you know what it's talking about? If so, you're the only person in the world and in all of church history. I listened to a sermon a friend of mine preached on this. He said that, that one commentator had found 40 different explanations for verse 29 and they're all terrible. No one knows what this is talking about. Maybe you do. If you do, let me know what it is. Discuss it in your group. Um, what is Paul, when he says baptism for the dead, now, that's not, now we don't do that. We get baptized, I got baptized for me. Um, it's exactly what it sounds like, being baptized for someone who has already died. Else, what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? The dead rise not at all. Why are they then baptized for the dead? Well, that's a great question. We're not, we have no idea what, what Paul is referring to here. In all of church history, there were two groups who observed, even within paganism, there was no baptism for the dead. There were two groups that... Uh, that observed baptism of the dead. There was one group about a hundred years after this, probably in relation to this scripture, they were trying to, to implement this. I think it was the um, Marcion's, uh, Marcionism in the second century, and the other one is the Mormon church today. Now, nowhere in the New Testament is anyone instructed to be baptized for the dead. This is where it's important as you read this. Is, Paul's, is Paul teaching baptism for the dead? Is he prescribing we do something? Or is he describing what they are doing? When you read through Scripture, you need to understand that. What's being described? Are you being, is it describing what someone is doing? Or is it prescribing and saying this is what we should do? Well, this is very clearly describing what is being done. And Paul is not affirming this by any means by saying this. When he says, what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? So Paul never taught this practice. You don't find this anywhere else in Scripture. And probably what Paul is saying is he's making this reference. He's not taking the time because, you know, it, it, there's several times that he'll say, he'll say I'm going to stop right here, but I'll set these other things in order when I come to you. He can't address every single error. So he just makes a passing reference to this practice of being baptized for those who had died. But Paul never taught this practice. And probably what's, been, what's happening here is that whoever these false teachers are that are denying the resurrection are probably also at the same time teaching this idea of baptism for the dead. So what Paul is pointing to is saying in their error, in their false teaching, even just within this false, their, their, their own false teaching, there's inconsistencies. Why are they doing the baptism for the dead if they're denying the resurrection? That's probably what Paul is referring to there. But that's my best guess at it. That's my best shot. So if you've got a better one, I'd like to hear it. But um, most likely Paul is pointing to their inconsistency of this practice, which is inconsistent with their denial of the resurrection. He's saying they're not even internally consistent in their false teaching. Okay, verse 30. And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? So Paul's saying if, if, if there's no resurrection... In this life is all there is. Why am I ruining my life, basically? Why stand we in jeopardy every hour? He said, I could be murdered at any point. There's been, already been attempts upon my life. This brief life which I have could already be, could be destroyed. Why am I going through this if there's no resurrection? I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it me if the dead rise not? Okay. So when did Paul fight with beast at Ephesus? Now, 
We know that there was a it was a common practice in the Roman world about basically throwing people to the lines, something of that nature, and that probably did happen at Ephesus. But Paul is writing this letter from Ephesus. He spent three years there. So what reference is he making when he says, I have fought with beasts at Ephesus? If after the manner of men I fought with beasts with Ephesus, what advantage is it me if the dead rise not? Well, there's several reasons why probably what Paul is talking about is that he is, it's, it, is it would be more like a spiritual warfare that he's fighting there at Ephesus. And the reason I say that is, is that when you fought with beasts, um, you didn't write letters later on. That was a form of execution. You did not, that, the idea wasn't that, oh, you might be able to defeat the lion. No, they're going to make sure you don't defeat the lion. That is a form of, of execution, a very, you know, twisted form of execution. But that's the goal of, of that practice was to throw them to the lines was to execute someone. So you didn't live to write a letter about this. Second to that, Paul's a Roman citizen, and a Roman citizen would never be thrown to the lines the way that, that take your Christians with a, a Jewish background, something like that. So most likely, he's referring, he's referring to spiritual sin. You could say that this also in verse 31 when he says I die daily Paul didn't die every single day when he said I die daily he was saying in a figurative sense I die daily so you need to it is possible that he means that literally that is a possibility but it's more likely that he did not mean that literally when he says that I that he fought with beasts you know that's also the idea of like Satan roams about as a roaring lion well Satan is not a lion he is as a roaring lion and that's probably more of the idea of where, where Paul is fighting with beasts. And in his letter to the Ephesians, he talks about that, that Satan is a, as, a, as a roaring lion. Um, okay, so we come on down to verse 33. Excuse me. We'll go to the half of verse 32. It says, Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So Paul is finishing here his rebuke. And what Paul is saying is, I'm not risking my life and killing myself for sentimentalism or for a fairy tale or to start some new religious movement. He is serving Jesus of Nazareth, whom he encountered on the road to Damascus approximately four to five years after Jesus of Nazareth was executed on a Roman cross. He's saying everything that I'm doing is because there really is and really was a bodily resurrection and Jesus Christ rose from the dead and Jesus Christ is alive today. That's why Paul is who Paul is, is because of this truth, this fact of history and this reality. And we're going to close with that tonight, that, that when you, basically when you truly believe and accept this historical fact, it will change every aspect of your life. And it will become the foundation and the linchpin of your life, just as it did for Paul. But we're going to stop with that tonight and bring up into our groups and uh, to, to discuss what we've covered here. And I already made a wrong reference. I'll tell you before, it was Peter that talked about Satan being a roaring lion. But, um, but I still think that's what Paul kind of has in mind there as he talks about fighting with beasts at Ephesus. That's probably speaking more in a spiritual sense. But you can discuss that in your group.